you came to Breckenridge in the 1970s, you probably saw Jeremiah Johnson, or a man who looked like him, dressed in leather and fur with a fox skin cap, tall and handsome. Like Robert Redford, he had shoulder length reddish blonde hair and a full beard. Astride his horse, he looked straight out of the movie. He was such a spectacle, you may have asked to take your picture with him. He might agree begrudgingly and then charge you five dollars for the privilege. This is George Johnson. Breckenridge attracted an interesting assortment of nonconformists in those days. Dreamers, hippies, entrepreneurs, Vietnam draft dodgers people pioneering a new lifestyle for themselves. Of the many colorful characters in those days, at the top of the list was George Johnson. I've heard many stories about George Johnson, stories about the decrepit miners' cabins that he lived in, about his horses and his women, about his cruelty to animals, about his drug use and how he died. The movie Jeremiah Johnson inspired many young people to come west. The early 70s were a time of great cultural change in America. Here in Breckenridge, there were ample opportunities for young adults to connect with nature and experiment with sustainable lifestyles. George went beyond that. He became a mountain man. The mountain man was the ultimate expression of American freedom. A vast country spread out before you, living off the land in its seemingly inexhaustible resources. No tax man, no policeman, no politicians, no preachers, no rules. You could do pretty much whatever you wanted. The mountain man was a true American pioneer. George became the mountain man of Breckenridge. He hunted, he trapped using the old style foothold traps. He rode a horse. He made his own clothes out of the animals that he killed. He fixed up his cabins just enough to be habitable, but far from comfortable. He was a pioneer. Apparently, he was a regular guy when he first came to Breckenridge. He dressed in denim like everyone else. But a psychological switch happened the night he took the devil's weed. His buddy Greg told me the story. It was Christmas Eve, 1971. In George's cramped cabin, they made the concoction. When it didn't seem to work, they took more. Christmas morning, it finally kicked in. Greg said it wasn't like the wavy lines of LSD. It was acute and clear. Greg had a poignant but otherwise pleasant two-day trip. George did not. For two days, he was beset by little people who tormented him, babies with old man faces, police chasing him, Devil's Weed was not kind to George Johnson. He changed after that, his friends said. He became reclusive, a little bit paranoid. He withdrew into his mountain man persona. I didn't know George Johnson, but I certainly knew of him. He was hard to miss around town. I was a child in the 1970s. I was afraid of him. He was always armed with a rifle in a scabbard on his saddle and a sidearm on his hip. Trapping and killing animals for their fur horrified me. One winter, George trapped our family dog. He trapped a lot of dogs. People shouldn't let him run loose, he complained. People like my family were settlers, always getting in the way of the pioneers. 
Our dog Miller came home two days later as if nothing had happened, even though it was 20 degrees below zero. But he was trailing a huge hemp rope tied around his neck. Huge, like the kind you'd tie up a dredge boat with. Then George Johnson came a calling. He wanted his rope back. I remember him coming down our driveway. He walked with a loose confidence. Without argument, my mother returned the rope, and she could be a mama bear in defense of her babies and pets. George was that intimidating. It didn't occur to me then as a child, but knowing what I know now about George Johnson, he intended for our dog to die of starvation tied to that tree. That's the tortured death he inflicted on his own animals he didn't want anymore. I could never understand why women would be attracted to a man so heartless and cruel. But the local gals were enamored with George. He was handsome. He was unique. He had many girlfriends, but none of them could get him to settle down. Though he did father a child, a daughter. There are so many stories about George Johnson, many tales about his horses, how he would ride them anywhere and everywhere, including in two buildings, Taking his horse Thor through the swinging doors of the gold pan saloon was a favorite stunt. Impressive, too, because Thor was a big horse. He was 17 hands. It was a long horseback ride home to his cabin up in Monte Cristo Gulch. That's up by Quandry Peak, over two hours by horseback ride. So when he couldn't or didn't want to make the trip, he dug a snow cave on Main Street and slept there. He even had a little stove to keep warm. As with any legend, stories swirl around George Johnson. Not all of them are true. There are many local versions of his death. A horrific construction accident. He was cruel to his horse. It fell on him and killed him. That's the story I grew up with. The truth is, I don't know how George Johnson died, but I do know that he died in 1993 in Boulder in a nursing home. He was 41 years old. Though I didn't like him, I love that George Johnson existed. I love that Breckenridge was a place not so long ago where George Johnson could be mountain man where his uniqueness was celebrated, where it was okay to ride your horse through O'Toole's saloon and grab a beer along the way. Now as I roll through middle age and look back on my decades in Breckenridge and all the changes I've seen, I feel nostalgia for the Breckenridge that George occupied. There were a lot more pioneers then, not so many settlers. That's the thing about pioneers and settlers. There's always someone who'll come after you and impact your life. There's always a settler to your pioneer. You can't live in Breckenridge today the way George Johnson lived. The Forest Service kicked people out of the miners' cabins a long time ago. You certainly can't sleep in a snow cave on Main Street anymore. You can't even ride a horse on Breckenridge's streets. The town government outlawed that. It's amazing to think you could ever live in Breckenridge the way George Johnson lived. That's why it's important to tell his story, to remind us of Breckenridge's wilder days. If you are a settler, remember the pioneers, the people who came before you and made Breckenridge what it is today. Take a walk north of the gold pan to see some of the few remaining pioneer cabins. 
because it was in all ways gussied up Victorians and endless pavement. It was gritty. The dust of the frontier was still on it. George connects us to the wilder days when there were fewer people and way fewer rules. George's Breckenridge no longer exists, but it created the community we know today. For those of us who are enchanted still with Breckenridge's pioneering past, we are connected to George Johnson. <laughs>